Dr. Paul Saladino, a recently emerging carnivore YouTuber, reached out to me on Twitter wanting to collaborate, and I decided to do some research before having him on my YouTube channel. While I was listening to him on Ben Greenfield's podcast last week, something struck me as odd. He was saying some unique things in the context that I had only heard myself say. That got me suspicious. It took me three years of making YouTube videos and seven years of being on the carnivore diet to develop my understanding of it. Paul Saladino has been on the carnivore diet for a matter of months, and he's already explaining some pretty complex things. On this podcast, Paul mentioned a study in regards to constipation. This sounded really familiar to me because I had made a constipation video a month prior to this podcast and used the same study. So when I went on Ben Greenfield's site and looked at the citations, it was the same study, but not only was that study there, there were several other studies that were used in my YouTube video that Paul Saladino was referencing. This signaled me to dig deeper. Let's take a look at Paul Saladino's clips compared to my old videos. If you just take a step back and you think about the idea that the coffee is from a plant seed, it's a coffee cherry, and you're taking the seed of the coffee bean or the seed of the coffee cherry and roasting it, again, that is the seed of a, of a plant. That is the most highly defended part of the plant, uh, theoretically, conceptually, and that is where the plant is going to put a lot of things that are going to discourage animals from eating it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look in the natural world, very few animals eat those seeds. You know, they're, or they, if they have, they've eaten them for all of their evolution, and they've found ways to sort of work around that. But um, they, they may not always eat the seeds because they know that those those are quite toxic, and in some situations, they will, you know, potentially be very harmful to the animal if the animal eats the seeds. The goal of the fruit of, an, uh, of a plant is to be eaten by the animal and then be passed out, right, in a stool to uh, fertilize the next generation of plant. I guess first we should talk about how coffee is made. It is the seed of the coffee cherry, and anyone with a background in inflammatory plant foods understands that seeds tend to be the highest in anti-nutrients because that seed wants to survive the digestive tract be implanted in the fecal matter and grow into a tree. That's what nature intended it to do. Now, yeah, if you go on Wikipedia and look up coffee, it will say coffee is from the coffee cherry. But I had never heard anyone else mention this, let alone another carnivore dieter in, in this context of anti-nutrients. This one is really critical. This is really interesting. This is about eating nose to tail in the animal. And this is a really important evolutionary fact. Our ancestors did not just eat ribeye or tenderloin when they killed an animal. They ate the heart, they ate the lungs, they ate the liver, which is super nutritious, and they ate the brain, and they ate the skin. The requirement is that you consume the whole animal and that it's high quality. So if you're consuming conventionally raised beef ribeye steaks, you know, you're not getting the vitamins you need, whereas if you consume a whole you know, wild mackerel row included, that's where you get your complete nutrition. Uh, so to achieve this, you know, you could do research and like I said, you could find out, okay, what foods have what fat soluble vitamins and how do I get all of them in high amounts? You could do that. Or you could eat nose to tail, which is just consuming all parts of the animal. You know, if you buy some mackerel at the supermarket, don't have them gut the fish, keep the guts, eat the whole fish, all of it. Um, Obviously, most people don't want to do that. And, you know, foods like salmon roe, which are nutritionally complete, can be supplements to the diet. Uh, but those, as I said, require that precursor knowledge of what's in it. So, yeah, you could supplement cod liver oil. Yes, some people know about nose to tail, but not in the carnivore community. I've been the only person really advocating this for any period of time. If you're eating seafood, you're going to be getting DHA. If you don't want to eat seafood, you can eat egg yolks. Liver has some omega-3 fatty acids, but you need to think about this as well in your diet. Fatty acid profile, and again, we're mainly looking at DHA, and there is a small amount of DHA in liver, 84 milligrams. Nobody knows liver has DHA. This was a real red flag to me. I use a German nutrient database that no one else found out about outside of my YouTube channel. If you Google liver DHA, there is no data. You couldn't find it. Eating an animal nose to tail provides all the nutrients we need in the most highly bioavailable forms without plants and their associated toxins. Anything you want, this food has it in its most bioavailable form. Of that 65 to 70% animal foods was where we got all of our nutrients and vitamins that we needed for 
optimal health. Our omega-3 fatty acids, our vitamins A, our fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, all those are from animal foods and they are contained in animal foods in their most bioavailable forms. I've never heard anyone use this terminology before and it really started to aggravate me. He's essentially ripping off my videos. People don't generally like the taste of liver. Some people can tolerate it, not everybody can. I make liver jerky, which helps with the texture of the liver, and I can end up eating as much as I want when I do it that way. When I tried to cook it regularly, the texture was just too much for me, and I couldn't eat it. What I'm actually gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna slice it thin, and dehydrate it at a low temperature, and make it into jerky so that um, I don't have to like thaw it out every day. All I have to do is, I just take a piece of liver jerky and chew on it when I'm cooking my steak on the grill. And that's the main reason I like making this. Now, liver jerky is not too popular. And considering he saw all of these other things on my YouTube channel and mentioned them, I'm assuming he got that idea from me as well. The terminology he uses is awfully similar. Liver and kidney are sort of similar in their micronutrient composition. I think of heart as like a muscle. Uh, if you like heart, you can eat heart. It has a little more coenzyme Q10 than peripheral muscle meat, but I see heart as muscle meat and liver and kidney as probably the key organs that will complement the muscle meat. Up until I was reading that info about the kidneys, I really prized liver as one of the only organs you should eat and as well as brain. Like I used to always say, hey, get some liver and brain if you have to choose two organs, but you know, kidney really comes close to liver in a lot of the vitamins. Oh yeah. I wonder where he got that idea that, that liver and kidney are two of the highest micronutrient organs. That's, that's such a coincidence. I, I think the same thing. I think liver and kidney are two great sources of nutrition. So, so beta carotene is the precursor to retinol form of vitamin A. And retinol is found in huge concentrations in the liver. Are you talking about flavonoids? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so the carotenoids, the beta carotene is not a molecule that humans use. We use uh, enzymes like BCMO, for instance. People can have single nucleotide polymorphisms in BCMO, which inhibit or decrease the efficiency with which they convert a beta carotene, which is the plant precursor to vitamin A, into the retinol form of vitamin A, which is what we use in our bodies. But if you look at animals, and this is sort of what I was saying earlier, animals provide all the nutrients a human needs in the most highly bioavailable forms. There are two common non-synonymous single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, with genetic variability that result in a 70% decrease in absorption. This pretty much says that a certain percentage of the population cannot convert carotene to vitamin A. That literally says, while well, X percent of the population needs to get vitamin A, retinoic acid from animal foods. If Paul Saladino did his own research, he would actually know that animal fat can have both carotene and retinol. Why do you like salmon roe so much, by the way? You brought, like, cans and cans of that. Stuff. I love salmon roe. So I've talked about this on my Instagram and my YouTube. One of the interesting things about humans is that we cannot make omega-3 fatty acids, and we also can't make many omega-6 fatty acids, but... Omega-3 fatty acids are essential fatty acids that are required by the human body. They must be obtained by diet because our bodies are unable to make them. We need omega-3 fatty acids, and this is probably something that many people are familiar with, but the cool thing about salmon roe is that the omega-3 fatty acids in salmon roe, which are primarily DHA, are in the phospholipid form, which has been shown, at least in rodent models, to cross the blood-brain barrier much more efficiently than triglyceride or ethyl ester forms of omega-3s. Mice that were given identical doses of EPA and DHA in either phospholipid, triglyceride, or ethyl ester form had EPA and DHA plasma concentrations that were highest from those in phospholipid form, followed by triglyceride form, and then lastly by ethyl ester form. Process of molecular distillation involves taking the omega-3 fatty acids, which are in triglyceride form, meaning three fatty acids bound to a glycerol backbone, and converting it into an ethyl ester form, which involves removing that glycerol backbone and replacing it with an ethanol backbone. After the process of molecular distillation, the omega-3 fatty acids can be re-esterified into their triglyceride form. However, most fish oil supplements on the market contain the omega-3 fatty acids in their ethyl ester form, which is unfortunate because that's less bioavailable than the omega-3 fatty acids found in triglyceride form. Which you'd find in most fish oil capsules as triglyceride or ethyl ester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, the two sources that I'm aware of, of phospholipid-derived DHA are krill oil and uh, salmon roe. Krill Oil, krill oil and krill oil and krill oil. Salmon roe 
Salmon roe. Uh, salmon roe. Salmon roe. Dr. Rhonda Patrick here. Today I'm making some salmon roe stacks. Many of you may know I'm a huge fan of salmon roe because it contains the omega-3 fatty acid DHA in phospholipid form. Guess he hasn't been stealing from just me. Dr. Ranja Patrick is another contributor to his dietary knowledge. If he actually did his own research, he would know that DHA in the phospholipid form is also contained in brain tissue, so you could technically eat animal brains as well. He also didn't know that salmon roe has vitamin C, despite eating plenty of it. Paul, you should have watched more of my videos. His idea on piperine and sulforaphane is something that originates from Dr. Michael Greger, the vegan overlord, the string bean, God, the man himself, the ghoul, the skeleton, Dr. Michael Greger. And this was adopted by Dr. Rhonda Patrick, so we can assume that he got his ideas on DHA phospholipid, sulforaphane, and piperine from Dr. Rhonda Patrick. And his whole methionine and glycine concept is from Chris Masterjohn. And uh, Chris Masterjohn is a very underappreciated person in this whole dietary community. Uh, so guys, definitely go check out Chris's stuff. He has a lot of great work on things like methionine and glycine and vitamin K2 and deserves a lot more credit. On that Ben Greenfield podcast, he also constantly mentioned indigenous groups and ancestral wisdom, something I always say and credit Weston Price for. He's taking a page out of my playbook. Does this guy have any ideas of his own? He adds his research and understanding of metabolism to make it sound like his own idea. I have worked so hard for this to build myself up and create my own concepts of nutrition. And he is just ripping them off with his MD credentials as a front. The timeline is perfect. The videos of mine that he watched were several months older than his YouTube channel. This modern culture has turned into an appeal to authority. Always listen to doctors. It's evident that people like Dr. Josh Axe and Dr. Oz steal other people's information and rebrand it with their credentials. On to his concepts and why they are incorrect. Piperine in black pepper may inhibit certain genes and enzymes, but the overarching thing here is that every indigenous group consumed wild plant foods that have similar anti-nutrient compounds eliciting comparable hormetic effects. Small doses of negative things that end up aiding us in the long term. And the data on piperine is not definitive. You can find studies suggesting piperine improves metabolic syndrome and is anti-cancer. Showing an inhibitory mechanism without the end result doesn't answer a lot of questions. Methionine to glycine ratio is insignificant on an adequate fat intake. Shellfish, oysters, liver, salmon roe also have two to three times the glycine than methionine. Did this guy even look at a nutrient database? It would be an issue if you ate outside of indigenous macronutrient requirements, which are 80% fat and 20% protein. Uh, people that are following primarily muscle meat based carnivore diets might run into this issue. But Paul, if you actually finished reading that book, you constantly referenced the fat of the land, you would actually know that these indigenous groups consumed 80% of their calories from fat and 20% of their calories from protein. If you read that book, you would also know that your theory on calcium is wrong. Paul constantly mentions that they chewed bones in this book. But there are Eskimos who live practically exclusively on seal their whole lives, and yet there is no indication while they live that they are less healthy than the caribou eaters, nor do their skeletons show a lack of calcium. Thus, calcium deficiency is as absent from those meat eaters who practically never eat bones as from those who eat them nearly every day of their lives. But why can't Paul give me credit? He gives Ted Naiman, another doctor, credit, but he doesn't credit Dr. Rhonda Patrick. I think Paul is afraid of people connecting the things he is saying to these other people and having them realize that he has nothing to offer himself. Paul, I understand. You want to establish yourself and set up a practice, whatever it may be. But this is not the way to do it. This guy is still in his residency and he's been on the carnivore diet for five months. Just because you put the letters MD in front of your name doesn't mean you can rip off everyone else's information and use your snakeskin suit as a front. But how did Paul Saladino get to this point? He went to a meetup and introduced himself to Sean Baker. Ended up getting himself on Sean Baker's podcast, Human Performance Outliers, and has slowly been gaining traction. This guy is a snake. And he had a game plan this whole time. 
I may not be able to convey myself as what's going on in my head most of the time, but all of my concepts are something I've worked very hard to develop. I think Paul is beyond unprofessional, and it's very clear he sees an opportunity in the carnivore movement, but there are quite a few people who are ahead of Paul in line, and I think I'm near the front of that line. That's why Paul is ripping off my information. I'm sorry to bring this to you guys, but this upset me beyond belief. I haven't slept in like the past three days. Uh, I've been plagiarized in the past to various degrees, but not to this degree and certainly not in the carnivore field. Uh, He's essentially stealing my life work and trying to establish himself as a carnivore expert with it. And uh, he's stealing stuff from other people as well. I've personally given credit to everyone that's helped me along this journey. Uh, Paul Check, Weston Price, Nora Gagoudis, they all got me started on this movement. But these concepts Paul is talking about are from my seven years of hard work. Thank you guys for watching. If you guys would like to support the channel, please like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, share the video if you can. Down below is my Patreon, a great way to support the channel, as well as get personalized one-on-one question support. Down below is also my Amazon shop. I have various things I use in my day-to-day life, from cookware to salt. Uh, We recently started carnivoreforum.com, as well as my podcast, Perfected Health. All of those links, guys, down in the comments below. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Drop me a follow if you're on social media. If you do want to reach out to me for one-on-one consultations, my website, frank-tefano.com or frankatefano at gmail.com is how you can contact me directly. You guys enjoy the rest of your week.